Well, my name is uh, Joel Beakey. I'm president of Puritan Reform Seminary and also pastor in the Heritage Reformed Church of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I want to bring you the warmest greetings from both institutions. My theme today is taking hold of yourself and of God in cultivating private prayer. Now, we just read from James 5, 17, that Elijah prayed earnestly, which can also be translated in the marginal notes, that he prayed in his prayer. His prayers were more than a formal exercise. He poured himself into his praying. You might call it prayerful praying. Today, we are often afflicted with prayerless praying. So ask yourself, what is the condition of my prayer life when no one else is watching? Do I meet with the Heavenly Father in reality, in secret, through Jesus? Is my prayer only an outward form, a ritual of words? Or is it really the breathing of my heart? Now, perhaps you've once prayed in your prayers, but your prayer life has grown dull, backsliding, perhaps has come into your life. And backsliding usually begins in the inner closet of prayer. You used to look forward to times of prayer. You longed to be alone with the Lord, but gradually your prayer life began to disintegrate. You see, we must confront our prayerless praying, confess it to God, and plead for the spirit of grace and supplication to revive our souls. So then, what are the solutions to this problem of prayerlessness? The solutions for prayerful praying? Well, I believe it's basically a twofold solution by the Spirit's grace. First, we must take hold of ourselves. As Paul says to Timothy, exercise thyself, take hold of thyself unto godliness. And second, we must take hold of God, which Isaiah 64, 7 refers to when it says, there's none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. So I plead with you, I plead with you in this little talk that you would resolve to pursue a more fervent and faithful prayer life. And that will require of you to take hold of yourself and of God. So first then, take hold of yourself for prayer. What I want to do is I want to give you seven quick principles of how to take hold of yourself for prayer. Number one, remember the value of prayer. Like Daniel, we should be willing to die rather than give up prayer. We should always remember that prayer is essential for the well-being of our soul, that it's the most Christ-like thing we can engage in. We must seek to realize the value even of unanswered prayer. The Puritan William Bridge said, A praying man can never be very miserable, whatever his condition be, for he has the ear of God, the spirit within to indict him, a friend in heaven to present him, and God himself to receive his desires. Tis a mercy to pray, even though I never receive the mercy prayed for. My dad used to teach me when I was a boy that the most valuable thing in all the world is an open throne of grace, the freedom to cry out to God. But if unanswered prayer is sweet, how much sweeter are answered prayers? Joseph Hall wrote, good prayers never come weeping home. I'm sure I shall either receive what I ask or what I should have been asking for in the first place. So remember the value of prayer. Secondly, maintain the priority of prayer. Our Lord said in John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. I love what John Bunyan said. He said, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you have prayed. You see, you, you have to give prayer priority. And that means ranking it higher than other things. Is it possible that your prayer life suffers because Something else is being ranked too high. 
such as the electronic media, perhaps. Media might absorb you too much, take up too much precious time, or something else that you put, something worldly, perhaps, that you put before your prayers that make your prayers become shallow and cold and self-centered. Prioritizing prayer will require putting other activities in their proper place, but keeping prayer as your priority. Number three, speak with sincerity in prayer. Psalm 62, 8 says, Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Sometimes a sincere prayer, such as Psalm 119, is long and carefully crafted. But sometimes a sincere prayer, such as Psalm 86, verse 11, is very simple, short. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Or consider Luke 18, 13. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Either way, settle for nothing less than sincerity in your prayer. Thomas Brooks put it this way, God looks not at the elegancy of your prayers to see how neat they are, or at the geometry of your prayers to see how long they are, or at the arithmetic of your prayers to see how many they are, or at the music of your prayers, or at the sweetness of your voice, or at the logic of your prayers, but he looks at the sincerity of your prayers, how hearty they are. Four, Cultivate a continual spirit of prayer. Pray without ceasing, says 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. And that refers to the spirit, the habit, the condition of prayer, rather than the physical act of prayer. To pray without ceasing is to pray at set times and seasons, to pray with importunity and vehemence, and to approve various occasions to pray throughout each day. A story is told of some ministers who got together to talk about what it means to pray without ceasing. John Newton was there and some others, and a young woman was serving them, and so they asked her, what do you think this means, to pray without ceasing? Well, she said, sirs, I just sort of pray my way through the day. You know, when I get up, I, I dress myself, I pray I would be clothed with Christ's righteousness today. When I dusted the furniture before you came, I pray that the Lord would take away the filth of my heart. And uh, I set food and drink before you. I pray that he would be the bread of life and my water of life. Number five, work towards organization in intercessory prayer. You know, Paul prayed constantly for believers in churches all over the world. He was a remarkably busy person. His life was full of conflicts and trials, yet he maintained a system of prayer. He kept prayerless in his mind, if not on paper. And with God's help, you see, if you organize your prayer times for others, you will feel more burdened to pray for them, and sometimes for certain people more than others. But press on even when you don't feel like doing so. I'd suggest you divide your prayer list into three categories, people you want to pray for every day, and then every week, and then every month, and periodically update your list. Number six, read the Bible for prayer. One reason your prayer life may be growing stagnant is that you've neglected the scriptures. See, prayer is a two-way conversation, really. God is speaking to you through his word, and then you go back to him in prayer. So we need to listen to God, not just talk to Him. We listen to God by filling our minds with the Bible. Our Lord Jesus Christ says in John 15, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. So when you read the Bible, do so with the express intent of responding to God's word with prayer. Turn those promises in the Bible into fuel for your prayers. And finally, take hold of yourself, number seven, by keeping biblical balance in prayer. Now, prayer is essentially four things, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. But it can be broken down into more detail. 
the scriptures present various kinds of prayer. Praise of God's glories, confession of our sins, petition for our needs, spiritual and physical. Thanks for God's mercies, intercession for others, and our affirmation to God that we are confident that he is willing and able to answer what we prayed. The Bible also presents different contexts for prayer, private prayer, family prayer, prayer with friends, prayer meetings, prayer in public worship. So periodically, examine your prayers to see if they are out of balance and give more time and energy to the areas of prayer you're neglecting. And then secondly, and more shortly now, we need to also take hold of God in prayer. So let me give you three principles for taking hold of God in prayer through Jesus Christ. One is, plead God's promises in prayer. In his sovereignty, God has bound himself by his own promises. Thomas Manton wrote, one good way to get comfort is to plead the promises of God in prayer. Show him his handwriting. God is tender of his word. Some time ago, an elderly friend brought me a spiritual letter from my father who died while in the pulpit, passing from the pulpit to glory way back in 1993. But my dad had wrote a letter in the 1950s to this man uh, shortly after his conversion. And he said to me, I, I thought you might like to have this. And I said, like to? I'd love to have this letter. And I sat down and read it immediately with great pleasure. It was my father's handwriting, my father's spiritual experiences. So how do you think your father in heaven feels when you show him his own handwriting in prayer and say, Lord, do as thou hast said? The Puritans, you see, made much of praying God's promises back to him. John Trapp wrote, promises must be prayed over. God loves to be burdened with and to be importuned, that is, urgently pressed with requests in his own words, to be sued upon with his own bond. Prayer is a putting God's promises into suit. And it's no arrogancy or presumption, Trapp Tra goes on to say, to burden God, as it were, with his own promises. Such prayers will deny the Lord day and night. He can as little deny them as deny himself. And two, look to the glorious Trinity in prayer. Much prayerlessness in our prayers is due to our thoughtlessness towards God. Our prayers may come from the stress of an immediate need or crisis, which is legitimate, or they be, may become mere habitual talking to ourselves. But God dwells in our prayers most when our minds most dwell on God. True prayer is not self-congratulatory, but self-condemnatory, in Christ congratulatory. Therefore, when you pray, meditate on how the gospel reveals the Father, the Son, and the Spirit to draw sinners to God. And before rushing into your list of requests, bring to mind scripture texts that speak of the glory of our God. Turn those texts into praise. Ephesians 2.18 tells us how the three persons of the Trinity operate in our prayers, saying, for through him, that is Christ Jesus, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. You see, prayer is Trinitarian. It's like a golden chain that runs from the Father via the Son and the Spirit back to the Father again. Finally, believe that God answers prayer. That's how we take hold of him, by faith. I fear that we often don't believe in prayer as we should. In America, a man once set up a tavern next door to a church. There were wild parties, late night hours, sinful indulgence, and morning garbage from the bar on the church parking lot that so distressed the church that the people, the church people, began to pray that God would intervene. Well, God did. A tornado came through that town and actually wiped out the tavern and left the church untouched. And so the tavern owner took the church to court claiming his loss was due to the church's prayers. But the church members claimed innocence, saying, we have no responsibility. 
in the tavern's destruction? Well, the judge marveled. He said he never had a case like this before, where unbelievers profess to believe in prayer and believers profess not to. You see, faithless prayer is fruitless prayer. When we don't trust that God answers prayer, we call into question his fatherly relationship to us. Since he's our father through the blood of Jesus, suspicion toward the prayer hearing God boils down really to mistrust in the finished work of Christ. So let's not be unbelieving, but believing in our prayers. So in conclusion, ask God to make you a praying Elijah who knows what it means to battle unbelief and despair even as you strive to grow in prayer and in grateful communion with God. Isn't it interesting that James presents Elijah as someone quite like you and me with the same passions that we have? He prayed in his praying and he could despair in his despairing. Do not neglect to pray for your own prayer life. Pray for grace to believe and be thankful that God decrees prayer and gives prayer and hears prayer and answers prayer. And if we truly believe these things, we have sufficient motivation to undertake the journey from prayerless praying to prayerful praying, being contemporary Elijahs who truly pray in our prayers to our worthy triune God of amazing grace, who is always worthy of being worshipped, feared, and loved, even to all eternity.